I think a critical part of the, the Attorney General's role is to be the, the, the champion um, for constitutional rights, civil rights, um, consumer rights, public safety that the people need in the moment that they need you and to be responsive to what's happening at that time. And we've had some rises in some crime in some places in California. The facts show that. And the people want and deserve an attorney general who's going to take on those rises in crime and, 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 and commit to keeping them safe and, and do it in a way that is consistent with what is effective and what's impactful. I think that's a, a, a new focus that, is, um, that comes with the important territory that the AG has. And, uh, we've made public safety job number one, two, and three since I've been in the office. Mr. Attorney General, thanks again for coming in and um, spending some time with us and our multitude of viewers. Um, so we have a <laughs> lot of questions to get through, so we're just going to go ahead and get started, and the reporters will introduce themselves along the way. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. So Emily's going to start. Yes. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, I write the newsletter for Cal Matters. And before we jump into the interview, we wanted to just ask you a couple of questions to help voters get to know you better on a personal level. Um, so the first one is, what do people most get wrong about California? Hmm. Um, I think they get wrong that the making the perfect the enemy of the good. That we have a lot of good in California. Uh, that we are the fifth largest economy in the world, the most diverse state in the nation. We've led with progressive values that have defined who we are, values of inclusion, opportunity, equity, and justice. And we can both be a place where we promote social, economic, and racial justice, and a place where we can be economically successful. And the fact that we're not perfect in every place and space doesn't mean that California is a failed experiment. Uh, and I know that that's political and that's political rhetoric, but we do have challenges. We have to recognize them. We, we must recognize our, our homelessness challenge, our um, income inequality, our poverty, especially for children, and any other challenges. And part of being great is acknowledging where you've fallen below the standard and um, confronting it, taking it head on, acknowledging it, and, and moving the needle, making a difference. Um, but I, I see s sometimes people say they critique one aspect of, of California, which doesn't, isn't where we want to be. We'll be the first to acknowledge that. We collectively being uh, state leaders and saying that that somehow t turns into a, a general um, uh, you know, critique and denouncement of, of California as a whole. But I, I think what we've accomplished as uh, the most diverse and perhaps successful democracy um, in, in the world is, is exciting, a point of pride. Um, diversity is, is, is our strength, it's our secret sauce, and it makes us great. And, and um, so I, I think that's one of the biggest things people get wrong. I wanted to next ask you if there is a political issue that you have changed your mind about, especially transitioning from a lawmaker to kind of being the state's top prosecutor change my mind on. I mean, I th my mind is, I think, constantly and forever in evolution. It's not frozen, static, stagnant. I'm always open to different arguments, more evidence, more facts, and that could change my, that could change my mind. Um, so I think maybe the basis of the question suggests that, that, that I was fixed in, on something and then it takes a lot to move me away. I'm always interested in evolution and change and um, in, including getting involved in areas where maybe I haven't been as focused on and digging deeper and doing more. Um, so changed as AG. Um, I think a critical part of the, the Attorney General's role is to be the, the, the champion um, for constitutional rights, civil rights, um, consumer rights, public safety, that the people need in the moment that they need you, and to be responsive to what's happening at that time. And we've had some rises in some crime in some places in California. The facts show that. 
and the people want and deserve an attorney general who's going to take on those rises in crimes and, 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 and commit to keeping them safe and, and do it in a way that is consistent with what is effective and what's impactful. And I think that the data and the evidence sh leads the way on that and, 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 and guides the path forward in terms of we know that the way to stop, the, the, the biggest way to deter a, a criminal from committing a crime is for the individual to believe they're going to get arrested if they commit it. And so I've been very aggressive and strong about the fact that when people hurt others, commit crimes, um, violate the law, uh, take or destroy someone's property, they should be arrested. They should, they, they need, there needs to be consequences, there needs to be accountability. And so that wasn't something I was talking about as much um, as a legislator. The times were different, my role was different, but I'm talking about it now mm -hmm. and talking about all of the different types of rises in crimes, whether it's organized retail crime, human trafficking, gun violence, which fuels 75% of, of violent crime in California, um, you know, or, or human um, gun and drug trafficking, which we've been involved in, in, in takedowns uh, on. Um, so we, I think that's a, a, a new focus that is, um, that comes with the important territory that the AG has and uh, we've made public safety job number one, two, and three since I've been in the office. Great. And then um, kind of going back into your, your personal life, um, could you talk about one of the most difficult challenges or the most difficult challenge you faced in your life? Hmm. I know these are very difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I, I, um, everyone has dreams. Um, I'm living mine. I, I, I'm living my California dream. I'm living my American dream. So I can't say that there was something uh, that I want to complain about in, in, in my life. Everybody has adversity. Everyone has their own individualized challenges. Everyone has their story, their experiences. Um, sometimes the adversity is what makes you strong and what informs you and, and, and gives you the, the values and the vision um, or the, the hunger or the work ethic that you have. My life's given me all those things. And, you know, whether it's being born in another country, um, being brought here by parents who wanted a better life for their son, because the Philippines, my future there, did not have democracy in it, civil rights or human rights in it, the rule of law or due process in it. They wanted me to have those things. And so that was the, perhaps the hardest thing I ever faced was a decision that wasn't mine, whether I would be raised in the Philippines or in California. My parents made that for me. And, you know, I can't thank him enough for bringing me here as, a, as an infant. Um, because my story isn't possible anywhere else but here, I don't think. Uh, when I was young, I was inspired by my parents to, to serve, to help others, to make lives better. That's what they did, and I wanted to do that too. Whether it's my dad in the Civil Rights Movement, both parents in the Farm Worker Movement, or my mom fighting for the restoration of democracy. I, I share a birthday. My birthday is the same day as the Declaration of Martial Law in the Philippines, exactly one year later. So on my birthday growing up, um, it was always bittersweet. It was a, um, you know, a monumental day uh, for me, but it was also a reminder of what my mom's home country and my country my birth did not have, that it didn't have human rights and it didn't have democracy. And I went to countless protests and rallies and demonstrations growing up. And, um, and I wanted to serve and I wanted to help and I didn't see people who looked like me serving in the roles um, where big decisions were being made. So as a kid, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to or be allowed to serve in roles like I, like I had the honor and privilege of serving. Being a California State Assembly member was the honor and privilege of a lifetime. I never could have dreamed of it. And then being the AG of you know, this, this state, it's, it's something that um, I still pinch myself that it's, that it's true. Great. So kind of shifting more to your role as Attorney General, um, could you talk about some of the things that you view as your most significant accomplishments thus far in the role? Yeah, you know, th these questions are always hard for me because I, I tend to not do what I was cautioned to do early on in my political career when I first got started, I've been in elected office for 15 years straight, starting in local office, healthcare district board, then vice mayor, then assembly member, now AG. When I just got started, someone 
told me, you're, you're gonna wanna do it all, but you can't. You need to focus on a handful of things, maybe one, two, or three. Make those your, you know, your signature issues. Get known for those and make a difference there. And I've never, ever followed that advice. <laughs> and I won't follow that advice. Because I believe that if there's something I can do in any space to make a difference, to help somebody to make their lives better, to improve their life circumstances, I should do it. And now you're gonna, I, I, I am very hard pressed to, to ever say I can't do it when I'm in a, leading the, large, the largest State Department of Justice in the nation, a billion dollar a year budget, over 5,000 employees, over 1,200 attorneys. Don't tell me there's not someone on our team who can help this person who needs help. We can do it if we try, if we fight, if we push, if we work. And so I feel like I've made a lot of accomplishments in a lot of spaces. Um, one that stands out to me, that's important to me, is starting our housing strike force. That's never been done before. I care about housing, I care about tenants, I care about housing production. We wanted to put a stake in the ground, send a message to the state that there are laws in the state of California that are not optional. Mm -hmm. They must be followed, including by other governments, including cities and counties who shouldn't be calling themselves wrongfully mountain lion sanctuaries to escape the law. They just shouldn't. Just do it. Act in good faith. Follow the law. Um, the debate is now over. If you had some thoughts on local control, we debated it. We talked about that in committee. We talked about it on the floor. This is what the legislature and the governor decided. It's no longer optional. And so we've en encouraged and forced um, folks to f comply with the law. We think that's important. Um, homelessness, housing affordability, I think is certainly one of the biggest challenges in this, in this state. And so being, and, and, some, and people say like, I never thought of the AG as someone who could be involved in housing. And maybe that was true, or maybe there's a reason to think that, but we enforce all laws, not just criminal laws, uh, but also civil laws, including housing laws. Mm -hmm. And so we got active and aggressive in that space. I'm proud of that. We also started the Racial Justice Bureau. That was my second week in office uh, at a time when too many people, and one is too many, but so many people were being attacked, targeted, hurt, harmed because of who they are, where they're from, how they look, who they love, how they pray. And that is not who California is. And I wanted people to know that their AG saw them, valued them, and was gonna fight for them and defend them against the forces of hate and hate crimes. Um, particularly the API community uh, was being targeted, not the only community, many communities suffered and continue to. Uh, but as the first Filipino American Attorney General, as the first Filipino American uh, Assembly Member, legislator in the history of California, I wanted folks to know that I, I see you, I value you, I, I am you, this is personal to me, and I'll fight with you and for you to keep you safe. Um, we have really leaned in hard with environmental justice and making sure that as we pursue our climate goals, uh, clean energy, um, having a planet for tomorrow for our kids and our grandkids, that we only do that through an equity lens. And as we promote equity, that frontline communities who are first and worst hurt uh, by the impacts of the environment, who are uh, overburdened and under-resourced, um, often black and brown communities, poor communities, that they have someone who's gonna protect them and defend them. And I think one approach that I've brought is, is um, uh, that I'm proud of is that we believe that you should be ambitious enough to ask for both things that others have seen as mutually exclusive and intention. For example, we think that we can create good jobs with the uh, logistics and supply chain um, that we're building infrastructure that we're building out. So warehouses in, in, in the Inland Empire where good jobs are needed and we can deliver environmental justice. We can do both. Mm -hmm. uh, and communities deserve both. They deserve a good job and they deserve justice. It's wrong to say you can only deliver environmental justice but no job um, or economic stimulation or you can only have uh, job um, growth if you're gonna hurt these poor communities. No, you can do both. And we've done the same thing with our housing approach. We've um, some people find it I I ironic or um, confusing, perplexing, that we bring sequel lawsuits. And they say, I thought you were pro-housing. What's up with the housing strike force? You, you, you're trying to have more housing, but then you're stopping these projects with sequel lawsuits. We're not stopping projects. We're showing the way for the project to be built. 
you can't build in a wildfire prone area um, ignoring the fact of wildfire in that very area. You, you can't continue business as usual. You must adjust to the new reality. So we have provided guidance. We announced it yesterday. How you can build in these places responsibly mm -hmm. uh, with, den you know, with, with density, with buffers, with evacuation routes. It's a pathway to build and so that you can uh, be resilient to uh, wildfires and, and build housing. So um, we don't accept um, these false choices and, and, and areas that we think are mutually exclusive. And then, you know, back to your original question, uh, you know, I think we've more than met the moment uh, in addressing uh, public safety, uh, rises in some crimes in some places. We've followed data, evidence, effective approaches. We've been active and involved um, to prevent crime on the front end when we can, hold people accountable when it's committed and also work on and focus on rehabilitation. So those are just a handful of, of, of areas. I mean, meanwhile, we, um, our, our office uh, had the most recent defense of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, our Solicitor General argued it. Uh, that, that, that decision came down when I was AG, proud that our team, and it started before me, to be fair, under Becerra, um, AG Becerra, you know, we, we were responsible for um, Millions of people have an access to health care, regardless of pre-existing condition. High quality, affordable health care. Proud of that. We brought in billions of dollars with our multiple opioid settlements against distributors and manufacturers, helping address one of the ongoing crises and risks of today, the, the opioid crisis. Um, no, there's, it's, it's so much. I want to quickly jump back to what you said about public safety being issues one, two, and three. And you briefly touched on um, some of the ways that you've addressed that, but I'm wondering if you could be more specific and maybe pinpoint two things that you think have been most effective, either in stopping crime or preventing it from happening in the first place. Yeah, so, so um, this our special operations unit, I'll, I'll talk about one, and then two, our gun violence prevention efforts. Um, we have a unique and elite special operations unit in the California Department of Justice that gets called to get involved in, in serious, violent, criminal, organized criminal activity when local law enforcement needs support, assistance, and partnership. And we've been involved in uh, dismantling of organized criminal groups up and down the state because of the sophisticated uh, investigative and surveillance techniques of this unit that have led to a number of things which have enhanced public safety. We have literally stopped mass shootings in progress. We know from our surveillance that they are about to happen and we've stopped them. We did that in Fresno. We've stopped homicides in progress. We know that people are on their way to kill someone and we've stopped them. And we've taken down multiple groups from uh, you know, Fresno, um, uh, to Sacramento, to many other cities that were involved in trafficking of human beings, girls, including girls for sex, um, guns, including ghost guns, drugs, including fentanyl. Uh, we've we've um, held them accountable for their crimes and um, seized the, the drugs and the, and the guns and liberated and supported the, the victims and the survivors of, of human trafficking. So can you share any more details about this mass shooting that was prevented in progress? Yeah. It was in Fresno. It was called Project No Fly Zone in Fresno. There's articles that have been written about. We did a press conference with our Fresno police chief and um, Fresno DA and, and uh, our, our other partners. And uh, part of what we shared at that time was that there was a incident at eerily similar to the Sacramento uh, shooting that happened here, where there was. Um, evidence and, and that multiple individuals were going to a bar in Fresno to shoot the targets that they were seeking. And they were moving there in vehicles with armed. And our law enforcement teams moved in uh, just before they arrived with um, a presence and they turned around. And so we knew from the surveillance that we had that they were going to um, shoot the multiple people at this bar, and we, and we stopped it. And we were, um, it was great police work. Um, it prevented a crime from happening. It prevented life from being taken. So we're proud of that work. Um, 
I also wanted to ask you about um, potentially if you support changes to Proposition 47, um, which reclassified some felonies as misdemeanors. Proposition 57 allowed some prison inmates to earn credits at a quicker rate. Um, and potentially as well changes to the California Penal Code. I know that kind of became an issue with the Sacramento shooting where you know human trafficking and things like that are not considered a violent crime under California law. So I would love to just hear your opinion on those things and any other um, changes that you think might be necessary or not and why. I'm, I'm, I'm always open to changes to any law um, or proposition if the evidence shows that it's, it's needed and it will achieve an outcome um, that's desired. And, and so I, I'm not closed to, I'm very open to that being possible for Prop 47. Um, at this time, I have not seen it, but I'm open to it. Um, for Prop 47, I think a couple of things are really important to recognize. One, the $950 threshold that creates the demarcation between um, uh, a petty theft and grand theft, uh, a misdemeanor and, and, and a felony is $950. And that's one of the, in the lowest third in the nation. Two thirds of the nation have higher thresholds, meaning it takes more money to be stolen more value to be stolen before it becomes a felony. So we're on, we're, it's one of the strongest, strictest um, demarcations. Texas is at like 2,000 or 2,500, for example. Um, it's also important to note misdemeanors are crimes. Misdemeanors are crimes punishable by being put in a locked facility, a jail, for up to a year. And um, they're also punishable by fines. And if folks are arrested uh, for misdemeanors and prosecuted, um, there, there's criminal consequences for them. So it, it's not true that, there's no, that you can steal under the law uh, less than $950 and it's not, it's not criminal. It is criminal, it's against the law, it's a misdemeanor. So I think that's important to note as well. And the data shows that the likelihood of arrest is what deters crime from happening more than the length of the sentence, whether it's you know, 10 years or 15 years. People don't want to get caught. They don't want to have accountability or consequence. If they think they are, if they, if they think they're going to be arrested, then they're, more, they're less likely to commit the crime. So I think, um, and then Prop 47 was passed seven years ago. A lot has happened since then, including COVID, one of the most societally disruptive incidents in the history of our nation. Um, it led to huge spikes in lots of things, M mental health, um, more people stockpiling guns. Maybe there's a connection to, um, you know, the societal disconnection led to um, more criminal activity, including some of that we're seeing. So I think we need to have a tight causal connection. I don't want to, I don't think it's appropriate to say to the people of California, the problem is Prop 47, if you change it, all of, the, all of what we're seeing is going to go away. Can, can people, are people comfortable with that? Can they guarantee that? Do they have the data on that? Is that a pre-existing ideological position or a fact-driven data-based approach to solve a problem? Um, I think it would help if we arrested people more often and prosecuted them when they committed the crime, provide consequence for what they do, provide proportionate punishment for what they do. Serious crimes have more serious punishment, less serious crimes have proportionate punishment or consequence. We always have to go after root causes when appropriate um, if we're really going to solve the problem, mental illness, drug um, addiction, treatment. Um, so that's Prop 47. Uh, for, for Prop 57, I think some of the definitions of what are violent crimes need to be changed. Um, domestic violence, human trafficking, um, rape of an unconscious person. All of those should be discussed and potentially changed under the, whatever the appropriate means is for Prop 57. I think if people are asked Every member of the public, is this a violent crime or is it not a violent crime? I think people will say it's a violent crime. Mm -hmm. So um, I think those should be considered for change. Um, Prop 57 had many pieces to it, including the fact that a, rather than a prosecutor, a judge could determine whether a, a youth w would be tried as an adult. I think that's right. I think judges should decide that. Um, it also provided a, a path or an incentive or pathway for greater healing, rehabilitation, and change and transformation for people who 
are incarcerated to do what we haven't been able to do yet, which is address our too high recidivism rates. Recidivism is a public safety issue. When somebody fulfills their obligation under the criminal justice system, but they have an extreme li high likelihood of committing the crime again, we have, we have failed in, in, in our approach and in, in, in our commitment to keep people safe. I've always said that the, the, the best crime is the one that's prevented, that never is, because you've taken steps to prevent it. Um, the second one is, is the one that it's the only one you ever commit. And you change and you transform and you enter the society never to commit a crime again. The R in the CDCR has not been present. That is the rehabilitation component. We need to do more in that space. Um, MCRPs, men community reentry programs, despite to me, the inappropriate gendered name is a good concept. Putting people in community facilities, community-based programs six months to a year before they re-enter society, preparing them for success, addressing their, whatever their underlying issues are, anger management, drug rehabilitation, mental health services, getting them a job, a, a safe housing placement. That can help lead to successful re-entry and lower recidivism. So, um, <laughs> I think I'm back to the question before, because uh, I think you jumped in with another question before I could talk about gun violence prevention. I don't know if you still want to talk about it, because I, I said I'm going to talk about Special Operations Unit and gun violence prevention, but I'm probably talking more than you guys want yeah. me to. So, <laughs> we may have to move on yeah. yeah. Why don't we move on to the next area, and then I think we can circle back. We do have questions on gun violence prevention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Nigel's up. Hi, thanks so much for, for coming in today. And uh, can you hear me okay? Hear you great. Yes, sir. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Assembly Bill 1506, and for anybody who's listening later and doesn't know, uh, this mandates the Attorney General and the state investigate the shooting of unarmed civilians by police officers. So first big question when we've written about, the legislature only granted you half of the $26 million that you asked for. Do you guys have enough money to do the job? We do. We're making it work. Um, with more money, we can do it faster and better, uh, but we're getting the job done. and. Uh, one reason is there's been less officer-involved shootings that qualify under AB 1506 this year than, in, than there were historically. Historically, there were 40. This year, there were 25. So the workload is lower than we expected. Um, and we're also doing this for the first time. And so the first time is always the hardest to, to get it um, done with uh, um, thoroughness, accuracy, comprehensiveness that we want. And so we're on the verge of announcing our first disposition of the first case that qualified in July of last year in Los Angeles. You may remember that one in Hollywood. And so- Yeah, at Hova. Do you know when that's gonna be? We think likely before the end of the year. Um, what about the locals? Um, are you getting the cooperation you want from local DAs, local sheriffs, local police departments? Uh, does it vary? We have, generally, we've gotten great cooperation. We've um, come in with a orientation towards collaboration and partnership, and we've been met with that as well. So um, we're often not first on the scene. It's just impractical for us to be able to be. And so uh, others have been there first, and being on the scene quickly to be able to um, grab witnesses and take statements to collect evidence is critical, and we rely on our local partners, and they've been um, outstanding partners so far. And then once the investigation is complete, it's our own team that does the, uh, makes the prosecutorial decision about whether to charge or not. But we've had good cooperation. Sure. You know, we've been looking into this, and speaking of getting on the scene first and doing the investigation, we learned from a couple of cities that, let's say that in one instance there was a shooting in July of 2022, the CAPSA teams, the California the shooting investigation teams, haven't talked to, it's October, they haven't talked to the cops who were involved in the shooting, they haven't talked to peripheral witnesses, this is coming from the department itself. I'm, I'm just wondering, is that typical? It, it would take you know, three months to start interviewing the witnesses involved, or could these be kind of uh, standout cases? I don't know what case you're uh, referencing, and um, what you're saying is, is not consistent with what 
uh, happens in these cases. We, we're usually on the scene within hours. Um, and I get an update as to, um, like in real time, once we're aware of a qualifying incident. And then I'm told that our, uh, our teams are rolling out to the scene. Uh, to be on the scene and to be part of the investigation. So what you described is not consistent with um, what I know uh, to be the, the approach that we've taken and the time it takes for us to get onto the scene, the um, participation and role that we have in, in the investigation from the, er from the earliest times. So it's, it's, it's almost always the same day that we're on the scene. Yeah, and just to clarify that, that was from the city of Westminster. So just a couple more on these and, and I'll be out of your hair. Um, it, we kind of got to this overall, but what would you say is the reason the investigations are taking as long as they have, right? Because like for the one you mentioned, Matthew David so that happened July 15, 2021. By January, the LA Commission has already ruled 4-0 that he's clear. And here we are and it's 16 months later and there's been no decision. I know you said there's been one coming before the end of the year. So what is it that takes so much longer on this scale than what the city was able to do or anyone else able to do? Yeah. A couple things. One, we're doing it for the first time, and we, we take our job very seriously. We want to do it right, comprehensively, thoroughly, accurately. We want to um, make sure that we've done our due diligence, talked to the witnesses, looked at the forensic evidence, looked at all the evidence, and uh, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. This is our first one, and so we want to do it right. And, and our goal has always been get it done within a year, year or less. Um, we're not going to make it for this one. Um, so for the first one, because it'll be, like you said, it's 14 months or 15 months now. Um, and also, we're doing a full report uh, that comes with the uh, review. So like we're talking 50 to 70 page report. And we're doing it for the first time. We're finalizing the template, making sure we have all the right pieces and components. The first one's going to be the slowest one. And then after that, it'll happen faster. We'll have more um, uh, experience with it, more familiarity with it. We will have done it a couple times. And so in, in the end, we decided it was better to, to be thorough, accurate, and complete than, than fast. But our goal is to be thorough, accurate, complete, and fast. And that is, is our goal going forward. And we think we're going to meet it. We're going to have faster responses. Uh, but the first one is a little slower than, than we hoped. Sure. Uh, last one on this. You pointed out um, that there's fewer um, unarmed shooting civilians in this last year. Uh, what are the lessons are you pulling out of this so far in the investigations? I realize none of them are closed yet, but in 18 months, you know, you're a former legislator. Are there any rules that you would pass tomorrow that you think could severely reduce the number of uh, officer involved shootings? I mean, a lot is going to, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot with respect to tactics and sort of just bre generally speaking, de escalation and other approaches that could end in a nonviolent resolution. And our written reports that we share with the public uh, that, that reflect our, our review and our conclusions will include some suggestions for tactical changes. And um, if the legislature is reading and have, has interest, then they might see some things in there that could lead to a potential policy change. Um. So one final one before we move from this area. So in these cases, are you the one making the final decision determination on charges, no charges? I am. I am. And of course, I have a huge team, I have an investigative team and a prosecutorial team. And they have recommendations that they make to me um, and that they make to our, our chief deputy attorney general. But it, but it comes to me before it's final. Uh, okay, uh, next one is death penalty. Do you support repeal of the death penalty? And what about the moratorium? Is that, is that kind of where we should leave it? Uh, and if not, are there any changes to penalties or crimes that would qualify for, qual for capital punishment in your view? I've been very uh, consistent, clear, and um, I think loud about the fact that I'm against the death penalty. Personally, I'm against the death penalty for many reasons. I think that it is filled with racial discrimination. The studies and, and the facts show that, including the fact that you're more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white, meaning a white life is valued more 
than a non-white life. It leads to the death penalty. More often, there's studies that show that, that have been in Supreme Court cases. It's fallible, meaning it can be wrong. And when you're taking someone's life, you can't be wrong. And we know from DNA evidence that there's people that have been on death row who should not be on death row and were going to be killed um, wrongly. And um, so you, you, you can't have a, a punishment that's fallible and irreversible, and that the death penalty is both. And it's also, um, this is a, 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 another reason, but it's, it's not a main reason. It's very expensive. And um, what people think is, is going to happen almost never happens, that someone is actually going to be, be, be put to death. And so um, I, I think for many reasons, um, and just having a humane civil society, uh, we shouldn't have it. That's me. Um, I am not the voters of California. I am the person who is charged to enforce the existing law um, as the legislature and the Californians have defined it. Right now, the Californians have supported uh, the death penalty. And so um, if there's ever a time where I think something I'm being asked to do is unconstitutional, then, uh, um, then my uh, commitment to and sworn oath to um, defend, protect the, the Constitution will, will carry the day. Um, but if I have a different decision than what the people of the California have elected, then my view, my personal view, does not trump. But that is my personal view. Do you think that proponent, or I guess opponents of the death penalty, should go to the ballot again and, and try? I mean, there were obviously two two efforts in a short span that came close but failed, and then it's now been six years since the last time that people tried to overturn the death penalty. So, do you think it's worth trying again, or? Are you satisfied with where things are at now with the moratorium and no executions? Well, I, I stood by the governor when he made the announcement about the moratoriums. Uh, um, I think I, I told him at that time that this is the, the bold and courageous leadership that we need, and people are, 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 are hungry for it and want it, and um, at least from, from my perspective. And I knew, I knew it was a risk for him, and I thought it was a risk well worth taking, to do because to, you always should do what you think is right. And he did, and I wanted him to know that. Um, I think the people need to decide in California where we want to go uh, with this. Uh, I think the only way to uh, um, address a proposition where the voters have decided is for them, by proposition, to vote that they decide something else. And so to your question, sh sh should we? Um, based on my own personal view, I would support it because um, I'm against the death penalty. Um, but you know, I, there's a lot that goes into it in terms of um, identifying where you know the, the voters are at, what the current thinking is, what the beliefs are, uh, to determine if it's if it can hurt the effort long term or or help it. But um, I think if we're ever going to get to a place in California where there's a a, a strong position of being against the death penalty, the voters have to decide that and get there. And what about zero bail as well? Because as an assembly member, you wrote the law to you know, move toward a zero bail policy, and then voters rejected that um, in a referendum, siding with the bail industry. Is that another fight you think should go back to the ballot box? Has your sh uh, stance shifted at all since you become attorney general? Maybe just a, a quick clarification on, on this. Um, Sort of the terminology. Yeah. Um, I, I was against cash bail, and and pr promoted a risk-based assessment process to replace a money-based uh, system. I believe that the current bail system punishes poor people for being poor, makes the jailhouse door swing open and close based on how much money you have in your pocket, and judges you based on the size of your wallet instead of the size of your risk. And you can be poor and safe, or you can be rich and dangerous. And it is a very imperfect proxy for what we really want to know, which is, will you be safe to the public? And I thought that you should ask that question instead of the question of how much money do you have? And that's what we propose. Uh, there are tools now that very accurately um, assess your, your future safety risk. Uh, they, are, they are not perfect. 
they have um, problems as, as they are being perfected and as they are launched, including the potential of carrying racial uh, disc uh, discriminatory components forward in the assessment. So that, that needs to be addressed and that's a real and appropriate critique. Uh, but do I think that the current money bail system is still unsafe and unfair and unjust? I still think that. Um, and, I th and I think that we need a, a change. And during the proposition, the referendum um, that overturned um, our, our SB 10, our, our being Senator Hertzberg and me, mm -hmm. uh, I never saw any uh, um, political communication that said money bail is great, keep money bail. The only thing that it said was the replacement, the risk assessment tool, is imperfect and problematic. And so I think the appetite of the people of California is to move past cash bail to something else. Mm -hmm. But the something else, I think, is TBD. Mm -hmm. And it'll take time to get there and to arri arrive at that. Okay. I have a few questions about firearms. So I know we skipped over that, but now it's our opportunity to come back. Um, <laughs> I want to start with SB 1327. This is for folks listening at home, the, the bill signed into law now that uh, allows Californians, gives them a private right of, of action against uh, manufacturers and vendors of firearms that are legal in California. And I wonder just for folks who maybe haven't been following this debate, you supported the, that idea, the proposal. Could you explain why, and specifically, why that would be necessary given that assault weapons, for example, are already legal in California. So why would this additional layer, uh, why, why is that helpful? So uh, the context, I think, of the bill is really important, that there was a bill in Texas called SB8, which used this novel and, I believe, the way it was applied, dangerous approach to have private rights of action to undermine an existing constitutional right and to evade judicial review in the process. And it was designed, researched, thought about. Its whole point was to undercut the constitutional right to an abortion and evade judicial review in the process. And um, the Supreme Court, in the initial stages, failed to take out the issue and overturn it and say that it was um, a, a, a violation of the law. And so that approach, that tool, um, was on the table. And in California, leaders and legislators, including the governor and Senator Hertzberg, believed that if this private right of action approach could be used to undermine a constitutional right, then it could also be used to save lives consistent with the Constitution. And that's what the bill is. It's very different, although spoken about in the same breath, as SB 8, because it is not used to undermine a constitutional right. It is used to pursue constitutionally permissible efforts to keep the people of California safe by providing a private right of action against manufacturers, distributors, sellers of certain guns that are already illegal and, const and has been shown to be constitutionally so. Um, assault weapons, high caliber weapons, ghost guns. So it's used in a very different way, but I think um, one important aspect of it was if, if, if the Supreme Court is going to allow this tool to be used, we can use it as a tool for good, for safety, for saving lives. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shift and a pivot. Um, it's not the same, although it's using the same tool, it's using as a, as a force for good. So is this an earnest uh, uh, policy that you think will do good, or is this a way to call the Supreme Court's bluff in a way? I think that while it, the Supreme Court is allowing it to be a tool, that we're using it in the best way that it can be used, and in a way that I think advances California values. But it's dangerous, it's a dangerous game. We're using it responsibly. Um, others can use it like Texas. And maybe the Supreme Court will look at the landscape of how this approach is being used and, and, and try to correct it. If that happens, that's fine too. Um, but we also don't want to practice unilateral disarmament where there's tools in the toolbox that we're not using uh, while others are, while Texas is turning women into second-class citizens, stripping away their constitutional rights, using this tool to do so at a time when they had the constitutional right. It was pre-Dobbs. Um, we can use that tool to save more lives and, and, and use it in a way that we think is responsible, consistent with our values, that's constitutional, and 
1327 is. Okay. The um, some ongoing uh, concern in California, the ongoing problem is ensuring that uh, people who are already legally not allowed to have guns, felons, uh, uh, domestic abusers, that they that the guns do not fall into their hands, that they're, they're taken away. Um, can you talk about what your office has done or what it could do or what you want to do to sort of improve that system? Yeah. Um, so we, we have a a unique in the nation, first in the nation, uh, innovative uh, approach, which is powerful in its simplicity to keep guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them. It's called the, it's called the Armed Prohibited Person System, APPS. And basically, it just it cross-references two databases. One, all the people that we know have guns, and all the people that we know shouldn't have guns. And, and we, we cross-reference them, and then when there's someone on both lists, uh, they're on the APPS list. And we, they're, they're prohibited from having a gun because they bought one legally at one point and then became disqualified because of a criminal conviction or a restraining order or um, um, a, a disqualifying mental illness. Those are all examples. And so we, um, the, the, the brave men and women agents in our office uh, that are part of these apps teams go around the state knocking on doors of the individuals who we know have guns and shouldn't have them and we remove them before someone can be hurt. And that approach has, uh, is common sense, I believe. It has had bipartisan support. Um, and uh, we believe it is uh, a powerful tool to keep people safe. We've increased, under my watch, the number of um, uh, contacts, as well as the number of removals of, of guns under apps. And there's more to do. Um, uh, the legislature has made more um, disqualifying incidents. And so, roughly speaking, we remove about 10,000 guns from the hands of, shouldn't, of those who shouldn't have them in California, and then at, during that same time period, 10,000 more new ones come on. So, sometimes people like to refer to a, a backlog. It's more a dynamic, um, ever-growing um, uh, list of, of, of those on, on, on the apps list. And so we're thinking about better ways, more efficient ways to keep people safe and implement apps. One is an approach called relinquishment, where at the time someone is disqualified from having a gun, the gun is removed from their hand. So when the court uh, or the jury uh, comes back with a conviction and they're disqualified, then at that moment or that day, you remove the gun from their hands, or when someone is served with a restraining order. Uh, right now, people get convicted and then they're on the list for months. Hmm. And so... Um, but respectfully, I mean, I've been covering apps through three different attorney generals now, and I've heard discussion about relinquishment going all the way back to when Kamala Harris was still the attorney general. Well, why isn't that happening yet if that's viewed as a potential solution to deal with that huge amount of cases? I mean, one, one part is it requires resources at the, the point of, and time of relinquishment. And so usually that's sheriff's deputies in the courthouse, in the county courthouse that would be responsible for the removal. We've had two pilot programs that have been successful, um, one in the Bay Area and one up north, in the North State. And we think those are good indicators of a pathway. One thing that's never happened as well is, is, is partnering with local jurisdictions to help re reduce the, the, the apps list. We're doing that. We're giving grants to sheriffs. We think more team members helping reduce the apps list is good. Um, so, just because things have been a certain way doesn't mean they can't be a different way, and we're approaching new ways that we think will work um, in the interest of the safety of the people of California. So talking about um, concealed carry weapons, uh, I know I asked you about this recently, but uh, SB 918, <laughs> um, it would have put new restrictions on, on uh, concealed, where people can carry concealed weapons and, and how, to, you know, uh, how easy it would be to apply successfully. Um, that failed in the legislature. You've mentioned that you want to see that reintroduced uh, in the next session. Um, recently, a, a, a federal judge in New York struck down, a, I believe, a similar law in New York, uh, saying it was not consistent with the Supreme Court's new ruling on this issue. So can you talk about that and why you think the California approach might, might fare differently? Yeah. Can, can I t take a quick related um, a a aside just to talk about two things I think are really important um, in, in terms of gun uh, violence prevention. 
And, and we've started a new Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Um, you, you were at the press conference in, in San Francisco. Um, thank you for covering that. And um, APPS is certainly one of our centerpieces for prevention, but gun violence restraining orders, red flag laws, are underutilized and work. And San Diego has used them well. Um, everyone should have what San Diego has, a police chief and a, and a city attorney's office working together to aggressively and appropriately go after uh, secure gun violence restraining orders um, with due process for those involved and to keep people safe when there's indicia, indication that someone's gonna get hurt and someone's gonna use a gun. Um, I also think that um, uh, gun, uh, Cal VIP violence interruption programs really work in places like Stockton and other places where uh, the data shows that gun violence is in the hands of a few and if you can have, get those people to put their guns down, oftentimes they're um, food insecure, j job insecure, housing insecure, and when you provide services and programs, they make different decisions and, and gun violence can be reduced. Homicide rates have been cut in half. So uh, that's, we really think prevention is important in the gun violence space because again, 75% of, of the increase in violent crime in California, it's, it's fueled by guns. When, 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 if there's a violent crime, you, it's almost, you know, it's, it's three quarters of the time it's, it's fueled by a gun. SB 918. Um, we long anticipated the Bruin decision. We knew it was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. We know the current constitution of this U.S. Supreme Court. We hope for the best, but we're preparing for the worst. And um, we, of course, are the, the U.S. Supreme Court um, pronounces the, the, the law of the land, and uh, they announced that you can't have a, a good cause or proper cause requirement for your concealed carry weapon regime, that you can't ask someone, what's your good reason for wanting it? Have you been the victim of crime before? Do you have a, a, a abuser who's stalking you? Do you carry large amounts of cash around at night? You can't ask that. Anyone can apply now. So um, there will be, uh, and there have been, huge spikes in the number of applicants. Um, and we believe that it's important to have a constitutional regime that allows for those who, who, who should constitutionally have a concealed carry weapon to have them, but to take the steps to make sure uh, that we are doing everything constitutionally permissible to keep people safe. And the Bruin, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in Bruin said there's two things you can do. One, um, you can do reviews of safety of the applicant. You can look at their history. Do they have criminal convictions? Do they have arrests? Do they have restraining orders for, for violent acts? Um, do they have uh, a mental illness that could lead to um, the potential for uh, gun violence? And you can look at all those things. And SB 918 proposed a whole um, series of safety uh, review components. What the court also said in Bruin is um, you can look at sensitive places. Um, places like, and they named these, um, voting booths, schools, places of legislative assembly, government buildings. And you can say that you can't bring your concealed carry weapon to those places. Um, there's also um, uh, indi indicia indication in the Bruin decision that it could be even broader, and you could include you know, big places for public congregations, stadiums, parks. And so we included a number of sensitive places in SB 918 as well. I think the New York case that you're referring to said that the number of sensitive places was overbroad. So we need to look at that, and maybe it is overbroad. And we should take that to heart and look at the logic and see if we agree with it and, and, and respond appropriately with any new um, SB 918-like bill that comes in the new session. But the, the goal remains to reintroduce this bill or see it reintroduced uh, at the beginning of the session? Or yeah, the approach. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, for the, the health and safety of the people of California, there needs to be a set of rules that is constitutionally permissible that keeps the people of California safe. Thank you. Um, one quick question, just curious, what have you done? What do you plan on doing? What would you like to do um, to protect uh, privacy and particularly children online? I know there are investigations into TikTok and so forth that you may want to talk about, but I'm just curious yeah. to get that over to you there. Well, uh, first I'll also mention I was um, proud to be a supporter of the uh, Assemblymember Wicks bill that used um, a, a, a regime out of England to protect uh, children and, and children's privacy. Um, and, and so I, I thought that was important. And um, as a former legislator, I believe in the power of legislation. And um, my role is different. I'm in the executive branch now, but I can still sponsor um, legislation, work with my former colleagues uh, to get new laws in place that, that provide 
uh, the protections and get the outcomes that we want. Um, we've launched investigations into Meta and, and into TikTok. Um, we also sent a letter to Instagram when they were proposing Instagram for kids. And we, uh, we being a, a number of attorneys general throughout the nation, and they backed away from an Instagram uh, for kids for um, you know, the youngest ages. We thought that was right. We thought that was a, a good decision on their part. That's what we were encouraging, and, and, and they responded uh, the way we hoped. Um, for TikTok and for Meta, um, we're seeing data, we're hearing from whistleblowers, Francis Haugen, who's saying that um, children are being targeted by the platforms for, to increase the number of contacts they have with the platform, to extend the duration of, the, of each of those contacts, and that there is physical and mental uh, health at adverse consequences as a result. Anxiety, depression, um, suicidal ideation, um, body image um, challenges, and others. And we want to know what these platforms knew and when they knew it and what they did having known it. And so that's why we've launched the investigation. Is, is there a timeline on that for some kind of resolution or findings of the investigation or is it open now? <sighs> um, you know, we, we don't like to have never-ending investigations. We like to get to a, a, a decision point. And some of it is within our control, you know, the fact that we launch an investigation and when we launch it and some not, if, if, if um, there's slow response to our request for information, um, if we don't get what we want, um, then we need to take additional steps to make sure that we do. Um, but we should, in 12 to 18 months, we should have a decision on whether we're going to be, um, the investigation is going to go to the next step or not. And the next step would be filing of a lawsuit. Speaking of investigations, uh, we saw something right before you came here that you were, your office was going to do some sort of investigation related to this tape from the LA City Council members that just leave. But it wasn't clear to me what exactly it was that you planned to investigate. So could you clarify a little bit about what your interest is in there and why you felt the need to step in as a state official to, to this local situation? Yeah, at the press conference I was just at about our new illicit cannabis enforcement, I, we got an off-topic question that was related to the LA City Council, and the question was, what are you doing? Um, I think it was one question, like, what do you think about it? And then one, w will you take action, or are you doing an investigation? And the answer was, we're looking at that incident to see uh, if rights were violated or laws were broken and you know which ones and what our authority is to enforce and so we have been reviewing that situation to identify if we uh, can um, and should based on the facts and the law launch an official investigation and so we're in that process of review now but we have not announced yet um, and we might not if we don't think there's a, a legal or factual basis, a, an actual investigation. But we're, we're, but we're determining now to whether the we can have. Is of the tape? Is it related to something else? Uh, we're looking at all aspects, but, but the focal point is on um, the potential for rights, including voting rights during the redistricting process, uh, being violated uh, um, if, if, if racial animus or animus towards another um, um, community defined by. Uh, an immutable characteristic has been if those rights have been violated. Um, uh, so th that's what we're focusing on. Is illegal recording part of your review as well of, of the actual comments? It, it, it's, it's on our radar. Um, though I would say not the focus, but it, it, it's, they're all inextricably intertwined. I'm just going back to one of the first things you said, you said one of the, the things you're most proud of um, or one of your top accomplishments since the creation of this housing task force. And, and, and you mentioned that uh, one of the things you hear from folks is, oh, I didn't realize that the AG's office could, could get involved in housing like this. And so I, I, I'd just be curious to hear um, how it was that you decided that you wanted to make your office take on this more uh, proactive, aggressive role that is certainly more aggressive than any of your recent predecessors on, on housing. You know, when I came into the office, the, the, the questions I asked were, uh, what do the people of California need and what can we do to address those needs? Not what have we done and how do we keep doing it? And if the answer to the first question is something that we've never done before, then let's start doing it. 
let's be responsive to and supportive uh, of uh, our constituents. And, and you know, the challenges evolve. I'm not, it's, it's no judgment on any prior AG. Um, the issues were different then than they are now. The, 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 the severity, the, the number, the uh, variety, the focal points. And so my job is to be as, uh, and focus and goal is to be as responsive to the needs of Californians as I can be in this moment. And the moment might change. Look, we, uh, you know, six months ago, we were not focusing on reproductive freedom. Now we are 10,000% in on doing everything we can uh, to make sure women are not treated as second class uh, citizens, that there's bodily autonomy, choice, and reproductive freedom. And, and that changed, and we needed to pivot and adjust and not say, we're, we're not, you know, we don't do that. That's not how it's been. Uh, but, but say, uh, what, do, what do Californians need? And, and, and to provide that. So, um, and I, I've been interested in housing as a legislator. My district is, is, has been a, a, a place and a, a center um, point and a focal point for a, a lot of housing, both tenant protection and housing production. And now as a, as a statewide official, I mean, this was also a role I had as a legislator, but um, pull the camera back, look at the big issues, the macro issues, and housing production is one of them. And, and one reason why is because every city, if you only look at your own jurisdiction and what your constituents want you to do, they often don't want more housing or affordable housing or new developments. And if every city does that throughout California, then that's how you get to two to three million housing units short. You need to have a, um, a pull the camera back global and macro view. And we have that role as the Attorney General. And, and so, um, you know, we were doing some things in, in housing, but um, not as much as I'd like, not as often as I'd like, and not as aggressive as I like. So we, we started the housing strike force to um, create a place and space for that work. Are there specific projects that you would point to that are getting built now that wouldn't have been if not for your intervention? Yeah, there's one in Encinitas that was not gonna be built, now it's being built. And we, we, we said, basically told them there's no basis, no legal basis for lack of approval. And then they approved it. So, um, since we're running short of long time, one final question. Um, there is an election, right, <laughs> in a few weeks, um, and people already have um, ballots that they got in the mail. So, um, to the viewers out there, why don't you just say directly to them why you are a better choice um, than your opponent? Um, I'll first say I'd, I'd be honored to continue to serve as California Attorney General. I think. Um, the last year and a half as Attorney General has been a good indication of the type of Attorney General I will uh, seek to be and hope to be and do my best to be, and that is to be the people's attorney, to fight for everyday people and to make your fights my fights, to fight by your side and with you to address the biggest challenges that you're facing, whatever they might be, and they might change. And whether it's uh, public safety uh, challenges or uh, environmental justice, healthcare, civil rights, housing, um, corporate accountability, gun violence, uh, freedom, including reproductive freedom and, and rights, um, making sure that you're not discriminated against or treated unfairly or the victim of hate crime. Um, I care about every one of those issues and will fight on, on every one of those issues. I believe that as a um, practicing attorney for a decade and a legislator for uh, almost another decade, um, and the fact that this job is the intersection of politics, policy, and the law, that I have a great deal of experience that makes me well suited. And um, I think my, my record is, is an open book. I've been a public servant for 15 years proudly, an honor to be so, and have had my um, uh, biannual job review <laughs> every two years when the people have uh, decided whether to keep me or not. I've been grateful that, that I've remained in office to continue to serve. and. Um, I'm always going to do my best, work as hard as I can, and do as much good as I can. So I'd be honored and grateful for a full four years to serve you and um, address your challenges as Californians and make California uh, continue to be the, great, the greatest state in the union. Okay. One more question, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, the Attorney General's office has actually been one of the most effective launching pads in California for higher office. And I'm curious if we would count you among those who might be considering a run for governor in 2026 or perhaps an open Senate seat if it comes up in 2024. Is that something that is on your mind at all? I am exclusively focused on getting elected in four weeks. And I've, I've 
gratefully, thankfully, been able to run for healthcare district board and city council assembly, um, but I've never run statewide. And um, uh, I'm, I'm the import, appointed attorney general. I'd love to be and be honored to be the elected attorney general. So um, I want to get through November 8th, and um, if things go well, then I'm going to focus on the work without thinking about a, a campaign at the same time. Uh, that'll be a nice luxury. And um, always want to serve at the highest level, the most people that I can. So, uh, but right now, only focused on attorney general. Can I, can I also ask you about this? <laughs> Sorry, last question. About this, uh, the two sports betting measures on the November ballot, both of them would give your office new power to regulate sports betting, and uh, whether in person or online. I'm curious if you support or oppose you, either of these measures and what you think about them. I'll say what I think about them is what I'm learning from the polling, which is that they're both not, that both not like, they're both unlikely to pass. Um, I'll also say that I do titles in summary, and my goal is to call balls and strikes and make sure I properly reflect what the proposition is so that the people of California know what they're voting on when they vote on it and to make it understandable to everyday folks. Um, and uh, because of that, I, as a general rule, have not gotten involved in supporting or opposing propositions uh, that I have the responsibility of writing the title and summary for. I made one exception because I think the moment requires it and because I care deeply about the issue, and that is that after we did the title and summary, after the litigation window for any challenges had passed and it was on the ballot and not going to change, I s supported Proposition 1 because I think that's the right thing to do uh, for the people of the state. Thanks so much for Thank coming. You so much. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for having me.